there has been a lot of talk recently about Syria. More specifically, a series of missile strikes on chemical weapons plants and storage facilities. Or at least, there was. When I began writing the script for this video, the strikes were the main news, and they were on basically every news show. But now, almost just a few three weeks later, there is nothing. I haven't really heard anything, it's been overshadowed by other news. Before I dig into the video itself, I kind of want to address that. As we live in a society where information is more abundant than ever, and where information is more dense than ever, it's very understandable to see how a news story such as this kind of disappears into the masses. We talk more about things that affect us, rather than things that affect other people. And that's understandable, that's not really the fault of anyone. The strikes took up maybe a weekend full of news, and a bit of ranting on Twitter. But more than that I haven't really seen. But history is a cluster of events, and I think that these strikes are more historically significant than most of us like to think. How we write and discuss about these news affect how we write them down in history. And I think dismissing these strikes over a weekend news cycle is disrespectful both to people affected by the strikes, and especially to those affected by the chemical attack in the first place. Now, on to the video. The strikes served to try to disable the capacity to store and manufacture chemical weapons. Will it work? I don't know. And is that good? Bad? How am I supposed to feel about these things? Is Assad an anti-imperialist because he's the victim of a strike? Is he worse than Hitler? I, I don't know. Let's talk about why almost everyone involved in this is acting in bad faith. But before I actually go deeper into this, I want to stress that I am not on the ground in Syria. I have not been personally affected by either the strikes or the chemical attack. But I do know that the time leading up to these events have created the largest refugee crisis since the world wars. So, if you can do something, you should. So, let's start. First, who is Assad? Bashar al-Assad is the president of Syria and also the commander-in-chief of the Syrian Armed Forces. He is a member of the Arab Socialist Ba'ath Party in Syria, and he is the son of the former president of Syria, who cooed power in the country back in 1971. During the Syrian civil war, the UN have found some evidence that implicates Assad in war crimes. Okay, and who is Donald Trump? Donald Trump is the 45th and current president of the United States. He has the charisma of an orange blowjob and used to be a television personality. He has been and is currently the leader of a number of failed projects and is currently embroiled in a collusion scandal. Donald Trump was also the one who led the strikes in Syria. And of course, we can't forget about all other players. Well shit, we have Putin who is supporting the Assad regime militarily, we have we have Erdogan from Turkey, who is currently kind of invading Syria, no one's really sure. We have hundreds if not thousands of various rebel groups within Syria fighting for their own specific agendas. In the north we have Kurdish militia movements, and of course there are also ISIS, kind of. So those are the players in this crisis. Now on to something completely different. A common line I've heard recently from leftists is that Assad is an anti-imperialist, fighting to protect Syria from Western imperialism. Which I mean is kinda true, if you squint and think that everyone who is the victim of an air attack is somehow an anti-imperialist, then sure, maybe. Now the problem with Western imperialism is a real one, and one that I do really want to get back to in a future video. It affects every part of the globe in one way or another. And it's why always the US, the UK and France go around like they are the world police. But no, I know, it's a legacy from the past. And there aren't colonies and protectorates in that way anymore. But... There are military bases and funding. 
as well as training, uh, supplies, political campaigns. In the Cold War, and some would argue still today, there were proxy wars, Western powers training and fueling militias and politicians that are favorable to the West. It is why most of the world looks like it is today. And in the case of Syria, it is why Syria is the way it is today. However, it also takes the shape of advisors who train and fund militias all over the world. For example, we have Al-Qaeda, who were trained by the CIA to fight the Soviets. That didn't turn out that well for anyone. And until recently, several rebel groups within Syria were being funded by the West in order to uh, destabilize Syria. Hey, it was a bad idea, who could have known? So we know that the West uses these tactics as a form of imperialism, maybe to a lesser extent today than before, but could you then say that Assad is an anti-imperialist? Is he someone who stands in the way of Western power, fighting for self-determination of nations? No, 100% no, not at all. Well, kind of, but n no. <laughs> The act of being on the receiving end of imperialism does not make you an anti-imperialist. In this case, it's more like a bully pushing another bully. Being pushed by a bully doesn't automatically make you anti-bully, although that would be the most logical assumption. But this is not the case here. Assad is not a hero in this scenario, not for anyone. And my take is this. It's still bad to use military power in Syria. And it's good, kind of, mostly bad but a little bit of good as well. Traditional anti-imperialism would focus on the self-governance and self-determination of all peoples. And that is not what Assad is doing. It's not what Assad has ever been doing. Rather, he is trying to preserve his own power at the cost of others' self-determination. There is a reason why Syria is very divided. He is not helping the Kurdish militias establish a foothold. He's not helping various rebel groups establish some form of home in Syria. Instead, he wages war on them. Now, that hasn't happened a lot recently, but that's because there has been a more pressing threat recently. Assad cannot be working for the liberation of all peoples. The chemical attack should make that obvious from the start. Yes, he represents a socialist party, but that doesn't necessarily mean that he's an anti-imperialist or a good person. In this case, it means that he represents a party that just happened to take power. Assad is, by most definitions, a totalitarian dictator. But... That doesn't mean that we should support attacks in Syria or any kind of military intervention. Assad is a bad person, but that doesn't mean that we should support military strikes in the area or any kind of military intervention. Assad is a bad person and he runs a dictatorship, but destabilizing a dictatorship hasn't really worked out well in the past. Any kind of war is bad, okay? It's not that hard. However, it is worth mentioning that basically all mainstream news sources in the West take their information from Western governments who were involved in the attack. And from a Syrian perspective, that doesn't probably look the same way it does to us. If you are a patriotic Syrian, these strikes could very much be seen as foreign states supporting terrorism, both with funding and military intervention. Now, before we go on, it's important to understand the context of these strikes. Chemical weapons. The important thing to remember about chemical weapons is that they are almost too effective. Used against specific targets, it is incredibly dangerous. And we as a society want peace, right? We all want peace. Peace on earth and all that hippie bullshit. Peace, even under pretty bad circumstances are almost always better than war. Or, you know, armed conflicts, as they say. Okay, so, conventional weapons. Guns, tanks, airplanes, you know, almost everything that isn't banned or a nuke. They destroy stuff, they go boom, they kill a lot of people, 
and they destroy stuff, destroy, destroy. You see, that's, that's kind of good. It's costly, even if you win. Say you invade a piece of land and the war goes on for a month or two and you have, you have won the war, you have conquered this piece of land. But now all the buildings are destroyed, roads are probably busted, and there are a bunch of people who now live in this area that you have conquered that probably aren't too happy with you. Even if you could force all the people away from your borders, it's kind of hard to get your own people to move in in these busted houses that you just destroyed, that used to belong to other people. Plus, destroying houses and roads and cities probably makes people mad at you, which makes them organize against you. And that's not really a good thing if you want to maintain stability over a country. And hey, you probably want people to like you, and you don't want people to be rebels. And this means that it almost always isn't really worth it to declare war and go to war and destroy a bunch of buildings. Instead, you could probably reach some sort of diplomatic compromise that's good for both parties. Maybe, maybe you don't get to control that piece of land, but, you know, trade is pretty good too. As technological development increases, so does infrastructure, which means that the more complex infrastructure we have, the more that can be destroyed. And you don't really want it to be destroyed if you want to control it. So conventional weapons kind of forces nations not to declare war. And the more complex infrastructure we have and the more complicated cities we have, the cost increases. In short, it forces nations to deal with problems in a way that's most profitable. And that's usually trade, that's not really war, at least not anymore. It is one of the major reasons why wars aren't really fought to the same extent these days as they were in the past. Cities are too complex if you break something that's gonna take more time to fix. But with unconventional weapons, like chemical weapons, the rules change. Theoretically, you could use chemical weapons to wipe out an entire city full of people, but the cities, the roads, the windows, the cars, everything would be left intact. The only thing that you would destroy is the people, which leaves you with empty homes, empty cities, ready for new settlers. The reason so many nations want chemical weapons not to be normalized is because they are almost too cost effective. If they became something that every nation would use, then war would suddenly not be as costly. There would be a, a greater profit margin for war. And considering that the military industrial complex is what it already is, that's also not really a good thing. And after the First World War, and also the Second, we kind of know the dangers that chemical weapons can pose. They have terrifying efficiency, something that you don't really want in war. You want war to be as non-efficient as possible because we don't want to have wars. Now the term normalizing chemical weapons is something that have come up in the news a bit more often these days than before. That is, many nations don't want these weapons to be normal among nations. That is, they want nations not to be able to use chemical weapons without harsh punishments. They want to keep the cost high. It is a weapon that is too effective, and as such, it must be harshly punished whenever it is used. Sometimes even if the suspicion of its being used, it has to be harshly punished. Mostly symbolically, because you don't want anyone else coming afterwards to think, well, if they could, so can I. And therefore it must be punished every time it is used especially when used as a weapon of war, and even more so when used against a civilian population, which is what Assad probably has done. Oh, I, uh, okay, okay, I hear you. It's not proven yet, it's still an investigation ongoing, I get that. But these weapons are so incredibly dangerous that even the suspicion of their use have to be harshly discouraged or punished. It should be the goal of all nations to be so transparent that such a suspicion never became a reality in the first place. However... A strike like this furthers the interest of very specific actors, namely NATO or other Western institutions. It's important to note once again that the intent of this strike was a good one. We cannot let chemical weapons become normalized. We just can't, I can't stress that enough. But 
these strikes have the added effect of further cementing the West's military influence in the Middle East. It also puts NATO in the role of some sort of world police. And that does beg the question, why? Why is it always the US, the UK and France? Well, two of them are former imperial powers trying to hold on to a failing empire, and the third one is the same, just 50 years delayed. However, the world has not elected these people or nations to be the police of the world and enforcer of international rule. And them having this kind of power opens up for corruption and is inherently incredibly dangerous. The strike in itself is a small piece in a much larger puzzle, and there are huge potential risks by allowing the West to impose its will on the rest of the world. In this specific question, we pretty much all agree. Chemical weapons are bad and we should punish those who use them. But would the same thing happen if the country was friendly to the West? History tells us that's probably not likely. However, what is the alternative? Well, the strike was carried out without a resolution from the UN. That alone would shift the foundation of power from the West and onto the international community. Yes, the UN is still very much controlled by Western nations, but a UN resolution would shift the power from individual countries and into a global perspective. It would also shift the power of the world police onto the UN, where more nations can have a say in the matter. Other alternatives are diplomacy, show of force, sanctions, other things that don't involve direct combat. It is worth mentioning that Russia and China wanted the UN to condemn the strikes. It didn't pass in the UN, obviously, but working outside of the UN robs the UN of legitimacy and only puts fuel on the diplomatic fire. From where I'm standing, it looks like all major nations only use the UN in order to further their own goals, and when the UN won't comply, they simply act outside of the UN. Doing so erodes the UN as a diplomatic institution, and it's important to know that this has happened before, with the League of Nations after World War I. If major nations only use the UN to further their own imperialist goals, then the institution will eventually become worthless. And besides, you don't need the UN to do peaceful diplomacy, to do cooperation. If anything, that strengthens the UN, even if you go outside of a UN framework. But, and I hate to say this, diplomacy doesn't always work either. And we've been down this route before. A few years ago, Barack Obama was faced with a similar problem. Chemical weapons had been used in Syria by the Assad regime. This crossed Obama's red line. And after the UK backed out, not having support in Parliament, Obama did the same, not having support in Congress. And France, being all alone, also dropped out. What happened was a red line was breached, but no military action was taken. Now, this might look like a weakness in the West, but a diplomatic solution was reached. An agreement was established and chemical weapons were destroyed. But if that had worked, we wouldn't be here four years later with a similar problem. But okay, let's say that the US had done a military strike in 2013. What would happen then? Well, that might have made a bad situation worse. Syria wasn't really a stable nation at that time and this was right before the very height of ISIS, and uh, who knows what airstrikes could have done to destabilize a country at that point. The problem is that we will never know. Maybe diplomacy is the answer, all the time, even if it sometimes doesn't work. However, the alternative is war or military action, and we've done that as well. And I think you already know where I'm going with this. In the running up to the invasion of Iraq, Saddam Hussein was accused of hoarding and producing chemical weapons, or weapons of mass destruction. This is something he has done in the past. The question that lingered in the air was whether or not Saddam cooperated with investigators and inspectors. The resolution that regulated Iraqi use of chemical weapons was UN Resolution 1441. After the Gulf War, the UN and the Iraqi government sawed up and destroyed as much chemical weapons as they could find. However, in the early 2000s, American President George Bush 
and British Prime Minister Tony Blair didn't buy it. They accused Saddam of not cooperating with the resolution, claiming that Iraq still had and produced weapons of mass destruction. Instead of cooperating with the UN, the US and the UK opted instead for invasion of Iraq, which led to the Iraqi war. As you probably know, the Iraqi war firmly cemented Western and primarily American military supremacy in the Middle East. And in the aftermath of the war, it turns out that Saddam did comply with the terms of the resolution. He didn't have chemical weapons, and they had been destroyed. The reason for that invasion was that Saddam might have had chemical weapons, and that he had had them before. But Bashar al-Assad has had them before and probably has them now. He is not complying to the rules of the regulations. Now, of course, invasions and targeted strikes are very different things. For all intents and purposes, targeted strikes are better. But it is important to know that full-scale military invasions have been launched for less. And it has also been done in recent memory without a UN resolution. The situation currently is kind of like being stuck between a rock and a hard place. If we engage in diplomacy, we might prevent further destabilization, but it might lead to the normalization of chemical weapons. If we firmly punish and denounce all forms of chemical weapons, we may run the risk of destabilizing a country in an already fragile zone. Both of these scenarios are doomsday scenarios, we can't let either of them happen. But we have to prevent them both. Preventing one might cause the other. And I don't have the answers here. But it is important to know for you as a viewer who benefits from these form of conflicts and these form of dilemmas. And it's not us. Lockheed Martin stock is almost a perfect correlation with the tension and crisis in Syria. And the same is true for Northrop Grumman and General Dynamics. Oh, and this is happening on the very same time that I'm editing this. As North and South Korea declare to work for peace, these weapon companies' stock plummet. Just so you know about that. Love that military industrial complex! Well, chemical weapons have been punished. Again, but one invasion of Iraq, diplomatic treaties and airstrikes haven't seemed to deter the use of chemical weapons for Assad. The US, the UK and France keep playing the world police and undermining the authority of the UN. Perhaps with good intent this time, but who knows the next time. The UN is already being seen as run by the West. And unless major Western countries take action to build up the authority and legitimacy of the UN, I think the entire idea of international cooperation might be undermined. So what is the right answer? Well, I don't know. All I know is that large-scale military operations in the Middle East have almost always made things worse. Diplomacy seems to be the good choice here, but as we see that doesn't always work. I think an important lesson here is that this situation should never have been started to begin with. The international community has to act sooner to prevent these situations from ever occurring. And yes, much of this has origins in Western imperialism, but that doesn't excuse the Assad regime of making horrifying crimes against humanity. Thanks for watching this video. If you are interested in my content, I'd really enjoy if you subscribe to my channel, maybe like the video, maybe leave a comment. If you want to support me financially, you can always do so on Patreon. I also want to give a special shout out to Abraham Aldridge, who is a, a never-ending source of inspiration. Thanks.